a good mother, a great one in fact. I gave birth to two children, and then I took in a third. But today, I will focus my talk on the journey with my daughter, Siwei. Siwei was extraordinary from conception to birth. Her due date was March 8, 1996, and she was born exactly on that date, International Working Women's Day. At four and a half months old, she stood up in her bassinet. At seven months old, she walked. At two years of age, she spoke in full sentences. At four years old, she was able to write her full name so she could get her, birth, her, birth, um, her library card. Afuya Pili Busisiwe Ayo Stuart Monsanto. At four. Afuya, girl born on Friday. Pili, second child. Busisiwe, blessing. Ayo, joy. No small feat for a four-year-old. She even started kindergarten at four years of age, and she remained at the top of her class, although she was the youngest child. At five years old, she started playing violin and cello. At seven, taught by her father, she started playing the acoustic guitar. And then she went on by junior high school to start playing the electric bass guitar. She was even in a band. This child was fast, smart, brilliant, stubborn, but she was a teacher's dream. She loved learning, and she learned fast. By the time she was 15, she had been published in English and Spanish, and then she went on to having a full scholarship at the Ailey School of Dance. But I digress. While she was smart, from a young age, she would cry until she wore herself out. Literally 45 minutes every day, tears, like clockwork. I went to school and I asked her teachers, was she like that at school? They said, no. Perhaps it's because she's young. Maybe it's a long day. There's no nap time. She's around so many other children. It's a different schedule. I thought it was odd. I mean, she's happy and helpful at school, but at home, she's tearful and stressed. I mean, she worried and stressed about everything. Will people like her? Is her work good enough? She would tutor her friends and help them. But what if she didn't help them? Was it going to be OK? She was a people pleaser, always stressed about something. So we had her tested. And she was brilliant, and she tested off the charts. But they diagnosed her at nine years old with depression and anxiety disorder. They said this was fairly common for brilliant children. They recommended therapy. Her father and I figured we would start her therapy after she came back from camp. She had been admitted into a math and science program for girls. Nine years old, a prestigious boarding school in Connecticut. We would do it when she came back. Sent her to the Connect program, and she loved it. It was academically engaging. She was learning things she didn't learn before. And then she hated it because she was homesick. And at nine years old, she was the youngest girl in this program and there was no one to wipe her tears. So her father and I, although separated, decided that we would go each weekend to visit her. We would assuage her fears, and we would be a united front together with her, wiping her tears so she could get through the next week. It was a lot. I was a single parent, a homeowner, financial services career. I was in a dance company. I even had um, a tenant, a car. And in financial services, it's a really intense work week. But we decided we were going to do this together for our daughter, Siwe's father and I. Paul, my ex-husband, he was beautiful and he was brilliant as well. We both graduated from high school early. We graduated, I graduated at 16, I think he was 17. And we both had one child before we had our daughter, Siwe. He was a good father, he loved his children, but our marriage, eh. that ended when Seaway was about three years old. <laughs> I wasn't happy about it. I didn't want to be another statistic, broken home, divorcee. But I come from a long line of we can and we do women. No excuses. I have a job. I have a car. I have a house. Next. Seaway, however, adored her father. They shared a common love for music and math and animals and science, and they engaged in conversations that I couldn't even fathom. 
She was daddy's girl, fine. Their relationship was so close that I really wasn't surprised when it was him that she first told when she was molested. The shock came that he didn't tell me until several months later. I was livid. But despite my anger, again, we dealt with it as a family. Police investigation and all. And then it happened again. Since our life was a series of his weekend and my weekend, and we co-parented well together, and most people didn't even know we weren't a couple, Sunday, December 16th, 2007, it was his weekend. I was at church, a cell phone rang. Paul, I ignore it. My work phone rang, Paul again. I answered. Paul asked me if I'd seen Seaway. It's your weekend? She's with you? Well, she ran off. Ran off? I say my goodbyes at church, and I get in the car so we can speak privately. Paul, what happened? Well, Seaway and I were talking about some things. You know, she's really curious about sex and intimacy, and I fondled her. What are you saying to me, Paul? Are you trying to tell me that you had sex with my daughter? Our daughter? No, 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 nothing like that. You know, Siwe and I talk about a lot, and there's this guy at school that she likes, and, well, I know this is gonna sound crazy to you, Dee, but I just didn't want her first experience to be with some knucklehead that didn't care about her. I hit the sidewalk and the side of a car. Paul, I don't know what's wrong with you, and I don't know what the police are going to do when they catch hold of you, but I've got to find my daughter. Back in church, we start making calls. We search, we call, we search, and I find her. And she's in a hospital near my home. When I get to the hospital, the police and children's services are there with my child. Paul was a good father. We co-parented well. He loved his children. Paul was a good father until he wasn't. A piece of my daughter died that day. At the hospital, she was so stressed and so concerned. And even when we went to the police station later on that Sunday, she just wanted her book bag. She needed her book bag with her schoolwork so she could be ready for school. Paul was also arrested that same Sunday. He never denied his actions. He went to jail. My life changed. I had been a stranger to mental illness until at that point we became intimately acquainted. My daughter was only 11, so thankfully we did not have to, she did not have to appear in court. At 11, you have a video testimony. But our life became a series of doctor's visits there was family court, and there was also a criminal court case, and then there's a children's services case as well, and they come to visit your home, and they interview the other children, and I still had that full-time financial services career job. And then Seaway had these fits of rage. There was debilitating shame. She would doubt herself and question herself. She missed her father. She missed our old life. She missed her grandfather and his family. Her grandfather, Paul's father, paid his legal fees, and he was out on bail three days later. 
I had started dating a few years prior, and thankfully, uh, Roger is an attorney. So throughout all of the visits to the district, district attorney's office, and then victim services, there's a whole other agency that deals with you and supplies services and provided therapy. Um, he was able to translate and explain to me what was happening and what would happen in court. It was helpful, and um, I was happy he was there for that. July of 2008 was when Paul was sentenced to five years in jail. I saw him leave the courtroom in handcuffs, done. We weren't in fear anymore. We wouldn't run into him on the street because we lived in the same neighborhood. It was a happy time. Roger and I were dating. We'd even taken in our third child. And things were going well. And at 12 years old, I got a call from work, and it seemed as though Siwe had attempted suicide while she was on a school trip. I was at work, and now I had to leave, and I didn't know when I'd be back, and I had never said anything to my bosses. I was in a management role at Morgan Stanley. I traveled a bit. And like most offices, it was a toxic environment. People gossiped about everything. And I was not going to have my child's pain in my life as gossip around a water cooler. But now I had to share. They supported me, and I left. When I got to the hospital, Siwe had to stay. It took a few days before she was cleared medically to leave the hospital. But because she was 12, she had to be transferred to a pediatric psych ward at a different hospital. With their visiting hours, I had to change my hours at work so I could see her. At that hospital, the doctor, after meeting with Siway, assured me that she would be out in a few days. It would be two or three days, and she'd be home. She's fine. I told that doctor that my daughter comes from a performing family, and she had been on stage dancing since she was four years old. I told her that she could hold up a good front for a little while, but I was clear that she had not met my daughter yet. My daughter remained in that pediatric psych ward for three weeks. During that three weeks, it was a team effort. I had to change my hours, so I went into work early. My daughter, I mean, my, sis my mother took the children to school, and my sister would help as well. And then after work, I'd pick up the children, and we would go to the hospital and have dinner there, and then go home and still have to do homework and bathe and get ready for work the next day again. That was our life for three weeks. And she came home. When someone attempts suicide, when they leave the hospital, you get your discharge papers, and they tell you, you should sanitize your home. Sanitize? My house is clean. What they mean is, you should remove everything that they could possibly harm themselves with or kill themselves with. I live in a house. It's a three-bedroom house with a backyard. There are gardening tools. There's bleach. There's cleaning supplies. There's shaving razors. There's kitchen knives. Sanitize my house? So our life of 24-hour, seven-day-a-week suicide watch began. She was never alone. She was with me, or she was at school. There was a family member at the house, always someone there, her two brothers. If I had to go on a business trip, she often went with me. We'd worked it out, and we moved on. She had started cutting herself at some point. I'd never heard of this self-mutilation and self-harm. We tried therapy. There was hypnotherapy. There was talk therapy. She still danced, she still wrote, and somehow or another, she still managed to graduate from her gifted and talented junior high school and get accepted into a specialized high school for math and sciences. She even kept writing. She had written so many chapters of a book that one of my friends set up a meeting for her. So this child at 13 or 14 sat down with a popular publishing company, Harcourt, I believe, in New York, and had a meeting with an illustrator, an editor, and a publicist about her book, although her novel was not yet completed. 
She kept writing, she kept dancing, we continued therapy, and she kept trying to kill herself. And she ultimately died by suicide on Wednesday, June 29th, 2011. Paul got out of jail, only serving four years of his five-year sentence in 2012. My daughter was dead, and this man lives free. Thankfully, I have not seen him, although we both reside in New York. I haven't seen him since he left that courtroom in handcuffs. How did Siway die? With suicide awareness and mental health, it's not safe messaging to discuss a method of death with suicide. I am a good mother. A great one. And I still lost my daughter to suicide. The stress of managing a career, dating, a home, being a landlord, my two children, a fast-paced career in financial services, all of that was daunting on me. At the worst of it, I had gained 40 kilos. I weighed 93 kilos, 204 pounds. I had been ill just before she died. I had to be hospitalized with a severe case of pneumonia. When she died, I was actually on medical leave, recovering from pneumonia. I couldn't go to work, I couldn't dance, so I went to Bikram Yoga. And at Bikram Yoga, I remembered that I could do that to heal my lungs and my respiratory system. So for seven days, I'd been going, and then my daughter died. And then I kept going to continue healing my body, but now to heal my heart and my mind. I found 90 minutes of peace on my mat. There was no cell phone, there was no house phone, there was no one questioning me about why. Bikram yoga became an integral part of my healing cocktail. I had talk therapy, I'd started that before she died and continued after she died. Yoga was a part, West African dance was a part, my mother, my sister, my family, my Roger, my sister friends, my community, my village held me up. And they still do. I come from a long line of we can and we do women. No excuses. I still had two children to take care of a man that loved me unconditionally, and almost 20 years in my career. But I had changed. I was different. So with the support of my village, I left. March of 2012, I left financial services. And April of 2012, I went to Bikram Yoga teacher training. I left. And before I left, Roger wasn't living with us. We were having conversations. When are you going to move in? He's like, oh, maybe August. And I said, well, I'm leaving in April for teacher training. So he moved in early so he could take care of the kids while I was away. I graduated from teacher training in June of 2012, and that's what I do. I teach yoga, and I teach dance, and I'm happy. Things shifted in such a way 
and I saw the magic that I found and the peace that I found from yoga and dance, and I wanted to share that. Yoga has taken me around the world, and it's actually what brings me to Kenya. While my daughter's death changed me, her death by suicide is but one. Globally, there are 800,000 deaths by suicide each year. That's someone dying about every 40 seconds. In the United States, over 47,000 people die each year by suicide. Here in Kenya, in 2007, it was reported that 421 people died by suicide in 2017. For various reasons, we all know those numbers are severely underreported. Ninety percent of the people that die by suicide have a treatable mental health condition. Some of them are in treatment and some are not. And what we've learned from people with lived experience, people that have survived suicide attempts, thankfully, is that what they want to end is the intolerable pain and suffering that they're living in. It's not that they want to end their lives. Every last one of us in this room is dealing with something challenging in our life. And we all have our coping mechanisms. Some of us self-medicate. I did. My drug of choice was food. For others, it can be sex, drugs, alcohol, or a combination. I am now living a life built on passion, purpose, and joy. I had jokingly said to some folks in elementary school, other parents, when we were talking about our children, that my daughter was so smart, I was going to wind up working for that child one day. And now I do. I'm the executive director for the Seaway Project, S-I-W-E, Seaway. The it's a global nonprofit, and our focus is bringing awareness and to end stigma around mental health conditions within the African diaspora. We have these things in our family. We just don't talk about it. There's too much shame. So we created No Shame Day. It exists every year in July. May happens to be Mental Health Awareness Month, and July is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And there's one day where we globally tell our stories with no shame. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the URL address. It's important work. I've become a mental health advocate. The me that I am today was born because of my loss with Seaway. Look to your right and look to your left. Take a moment and take assessment of your village, who's in your community. Take time to check on your strong friend. Hug someone, connect and mean it. Live your life urgently now. Tell your stories with no shame. Be seen, be heard. Tomorrow is not promised. Death is a reminder for the living to live. I am living my life in joy. Talmud says, he who saves a single life saves the world entire. Join me. Find your cause. Advocate. Speak your truth. The Seaway Project 
in the US, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, here in Kenya, Befrienders Kenya, do what you can and let us all together heal the world, saving one life at a time.